We will now turn to our own commencement speaker, Jeannie Gang, who is herself a GSD graduate, having earned her MR in 1993, though she doesn't remember a whole lot from her own graduation, apparently. Jeannie is currently professor in practice of architecture at the GSD and the founding principal of Studio Gang, an architecture and urban design practice based in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and Paris. Pretty cool. Studio Gang's work spans the gamut from cultural and public buildings to urban parks and high-rise towers. She's a MacArthur Fellow. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Jeannie has also been honored with the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award in Architecture, and she was named one of 2019's most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. She saw that. Yeah, that deserves applause. That's, that's something. Jeannie's all that, but on a personal note, I think she's much more. I have to say that I know few architects who are equally obsessed by architecture and by equity. Equity for Jeannie means creating projects for all members of the public, but also for the environment and for all living beings in the world. And despite all the challenges of the world and despite the challenges of running an office with how many people, how many projects, Jeannie remains an idealist. She goes further than mere ideal idealism. She speaks frequently of what she calls design's actionable idealism, its ability to create public awareness and instigate positive change. And that actionable idealism is exactly what we need right now. So please join me now in welcoming a GSD professor, a remarkably accomplished architect, an actionable idealist, and a friend, Jeannie Gang. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Dean uh, Whiting, so much. And good morning, GSB class of 20 and, 20, 20 and 21. Hello. <laughs> it's a beautiful morning. Hello, parents, faculty, family, and friends. It's really special to gather with you here today to celebrate your achievements as individuals and as a community. So congratulations to you. As you're well aware, today you're in this very unusual position as GSD class who's already graduated, who are just now participating in this kind of deep tradition of an in-person graduation ceremony. It's wonderful that you chose very intentionally to be here today to take part of this ritual. And I'm sure you did it for yourselves, I hope, and your families but probably mostly to be with your classmates. Um, and I hope a little part of you did it for your former professors as well, and because this faculty here in front of you is very proud of you and um, really happy to be a part of your GSD experience. Um, you know, when you were students at the GSD, part of the work was really finding your individual voices as designers. So through your coursework and design work, you developed your priorities, your ways of ordering the world. Um, and so as you collect your diploma today, I hope you're remembering the hard work you put in, the focus that it required, the sacrifices you undoubtedly made to achieve these well-deserved degrees. <laughs> but since you're also sitting among your colleagues, I hope you're also remembering the connections you formed and the shared activities many of you undertook. Zooming together, helping each other on final projects, reading each other's papers, critiquing each other's words. In other words, supporting each other to grow as both designers, but also as people. Um, and equally important, I hope you're remembering, as Sarah just mentioned, the intellectual positions you established collectively, the ideals that you helped to shape how you stood up as leaders to help craft responses to the very difficult situations presented by our society while you're, you were here at the GSD. And each and every one of you took a stand on difficult issues the world presented and continues to present from horrific examples of racism and sexism to the realities 
of climate disasters around the globe and the role of the built environment in contributing to climate change and injustice. James Baldwin, an American writer and activist, believed that students' awakening to the troubled realities of the past and the present was a core part of their education. In an address that he had delivered to a group of teachers in 1963, amid mass protests, great hope, and violent backlashes um, of the civil rights movement, he famously said, the paradox of education is precisely this, that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. So you are not just learning skills and theory and history and design during your years at JSD. You were, as Baldwin says, examining with a critical eye the greater context in which your learning was taking place. And through conversations and actions, you questioned and called on design education to address systemic issues, helping to shape and evolve the school itself in response to these crucial matters of our time. And all that work you did, whether manifested phys physically through protests, for example, or internalized intellectually, was compounded by the extraordinary hardship on your own education, that little thing called the global pandemic and COVID-19. Um, indeed, these um, global worries are still remaining to this day, and all that work is unfinished. But even if the world is, as my own mom used to say, going to hell in a handbasket, <laughs> it doesn't mean that you can't feel good about today. Even if the world is going to hell in a handbasket, we can celebrate the accomplishments you made as students, both individually and collectively. So what you did is all the more fantastic and worthy of praise in this difficult context. For you parents, maybe it's funny for you to think that I'm quoting, I'm not quoting my um, engineer dad for this talk because he was my hero, but instead my mom's colorful idioms kept popping into my head this whole time I was writing this. So they, they've stuck with me my whole life, so they matter. Like, what is going to hell in the handbasket anyway? These are just, but they can be useful. So um, the fact that you've been out of the GSD now for a bit, it means that there's a different role for me to play here today because I'm not addressing you as newborn graduates who are just stepping out of the classroom, but really as designers who have already joined us, the people working in the design professions and the academy. And even if you haven't landed a job yet, you are no longer students, you're no longer our students. Instead, you're now officially our colleagues, our collaborators, and even our co-conspirators. So this commencement speech then, it's given me, I'm giving myself permission to go outside of the genre of commencement addresses, and maybe we should call it the typology of commencement addresses. And um, the typology um, is gonna be more like a call to action, or more appropriately, a call to continued action, given your existing accomplishments that I just described. This call to action is really my opportunity to urge you to continue to bring that energy and commitment you demonstrated so well at GSD to your current environment, wherever you landed in the past year or so. For let us admit that the design professions today are still lacking in diversity, lacking in equity, lacking in inclusion, and a feeling of belonging for all. The price one pays for pursuing any profession or calling is an intimate knowledge of its ugly side. And that was also James Baldwin again in an essay from 1961, where he was really referring to politics, but the insight is equally true for any field. And for us, it means that we acknowledge there's still problems within the design profession, yet at this time, we recognize now that we are the design professions. And it's true that deeply pursuing design professions can and will reveal their ugly side. I'm thinking specifically of the way that racial zoning and redlining were urban planning policies that led to segregation of American cities, for example. Um, but you can, so you can continue to develop those skills and credentials that are required to practice design in your job. You can continue 
to contribute to projects and become licensed. But please realize that design professions with whom you are now working also need to learn from you. Uh, you had an important experience here at the GCD, and now we need you to bring your insights and your ability to speak up, your competence in diversity and inclusion, and most of all, your sense of what's just just and good and fair to the profession you've already entered. And though none of the profession's issues are your fault, I hope you will share your experiences and play a role helping your offices adjust course and prepare for a better future. And if you can help get this work started, I think you'll find an openness to it. The good news is that, like you, all designers, the good ones anyway, are inherently curious, tend to deeply question things, and are often already searching for new solutions themselves. It's really the foundation of our education. We question everything. So here we go. If you were to ask a GSD grad, in all seriousness, how many designers does it take to change a light bulb? You'd probably get an answer like, does it really need to have to be a light bulb? I mean, why does it have to be a light bulb? I mean, because I got this other idea. Just kidding, but we are questioning. <laughs> I thought there would be more laughs than that, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, because this is a silly group, I mean, when you get them all together, you normally. Um, for designers, I think new possibilities are always available. And in other words, to be a designer is to be comfortable with change. Change is in our DNA, and because we are the design professions, when we change ourselves, we can change the profession. So I've been speaking of the collective community you are now a part of, but let's get back to your individual goals and the, your individual point of view, the voice that you developed at the GSD. How can your particular gifts and interests as a, design, as a designer or planner or landscape architect or urban designer fit into these larger movements of change? Is it necessary to squash your own creativity and your desire to make something beautiful in order to serve the greater good? How do concerns of the individual and the collective come to confront each other in our current world? When I started my office, Studio Gang, I was never looking to be famous or wealthy or powerful. I was in search of one thing, it was freedom. Creative freedom to approach design with my own individual sensibilities. And freedom as a leader to organize the work of design in a different way than what I saw happening at the time. You see, many architecture office cultures back then uh, they followed what was called the Darwinian model. It was, it was natural selection and survival of the fittest. Only their definition of who was the fittest was almost always someone who was the same race and gender as the boss, <laughs> and nature had nothing to do with the selections, let me tell you, for promotions, et cetera. <laughs> so those choices were really made by people, people who, well, they looked exactly like each other, and it made those architecture offices back then feel very homogenous and difficult to access. What we can truly learn from nature is very different, though. It's like it's continuous experiments and it's endless adaptations. Evolution is always giving different ideas a chance in a search for better solutions, sometimes finding them accidentally but always recognizing and adopting something that's new, that's good, and something that works. So to make a different kind of architecture office model, one that fit me, um, I look to nature, by which I mean ecology, with all of its variations, its efficiency, its mutualism, and its beauty. For the office structure, I said, let's try a more collaborative, mutualistic approach with diverse designers and collaborators who can each bring different perspectives and different experiences to the table. Let's design our projects not as a singular standalone building, but as crucial elements within urban systems, facilitating relationships between people and their environments. And while we're at it, let's aim to bring more community participants into the creative process to make the work more relevant to the people who will actually and eventually live with it. 
So the reason I'm telling you about my story is really because it's interesting, I think, to know that I started out thinking it was my own individual voice that I needed, that needed to be heard. Yet in pursuing that uniqueness, I landed on a completely different idea that was architecture is better when it's created in concert with other disciplines, with the client, with each other, and when different individual voices are brought together. It, it really reminds me so much of the work of um, this really interesting person, Bernie Krauss. And Bernie Krauss is a soundscape ecologist and bioacoustician who's made over 5,000 hours of sound recordings documenting over 15,000 species of animals. Originally, he focused on finding and isolating the sound of the individual species. But when, uh, but that was when he began recording, but then he started to realize that listening to the full richness of a location's animal sounds, that he made a, ground, a groundbreaking discovery. In any given place, uh, diverse voices of the animals are evenly distributed across the sonic spectrum, each claiming their own specific specific frequency, like channels on a radio, in order to communicate without being drowned out, they find these uh, frequencies. So Krauss called this phenom phenomenon the great animal orchestra. And listening to his recordings of these soundscapes recorded all over the world will fill you with wonder at the diversity and beauty of life on this planet. The desires we have as individuals to be creatively free are always bracketed by responsibilities we have to the greater community, the numerous communities to which we belong. We are each one voice within a much larger orchestra. I like Canadian writer and fellow Harvard grad, Margaret Atwood, who shared some very clear words on this topic about the freedom that comes when we're honest about our own limits as individuals and those of the planet. She said, some people, by freedom, mean freedom to do whatever they want with any, without any limitation whatsoever. This isn't the pack of tar cards we're dealt. We are dealt a limited pack. So I would see freedom more as the power to use what you're given in the best way you can. So now, once you've recognized your place within the orchestra, let's say, what can you do with it? Um, as my office evolved, I started calling our approach, as Sarah mentioned, actionable idealism. It just means that through design, we want to change things for the better, and we believe we can. That's the, that's the idealism part. And at the same time, we want to get things done and not waste time. That's the actionable part. To be honest, I found this is not simple or easy, an easy way to practice. You have to develop certain skills that you're likely haven't learned in school or been exposed too much to, such as listening, especially to people who may have very little design experience but hold divergent points of view. But you won't be able to motivate anyone to get behind your vision unless you demonstrate that you've heard them and respond to, their, to them with kindness, showing them that they too have a place in the future you're designing together. And then there's compromise, which many view as giving up or losing your freedom, but which can actually improve design by forcing you to define and defend the essence and let go of what is extraneous. Um, patience is another, <laughs> another quality you need. Um, for designing environments is a really long game, and there will be many obstacles along the way, but now, but know that the satisfaction of seeing something built is amazing, and it will be very much well worth it. Lena Bobardi was an architect who I think can be inspirational for all the graduates here today, uh, because she saw architecture not as built buildings, but as a means of facing different situations. And she dedicated her career to bringing people together from all walks of light, life. And it's because she understood this interdependent ecological view of the world that she could mine its creative potential and produce work that embraced how people live. The artist's freedom, she said, has always been individual, but true freedom can only be collective, a freedom aware of social responsibilities 
which can knock down the frontiers of aesthetics. Wow, true, true that. <laughs> um, to end this talk, I just want to add a few thoughts about this big P word, power. Um, like my mom always said, again, it's like, now don't get too big for your britches, which was, as we all mean, some, it means something like, don't think too highly of yourself. And I guess it also means that if you do, you're going to start puffing up and popping out of your clothes or something. I'm not sure exactly. But um, power, it's, it's a little bit different. Power is it's at some point in the future, you're no longer going to be an intern um, or a newbie in the office or a junior faculty member in your university. You're going to get some power. And hopefully, like me, it won't be because you were out trying to pursue it. Because the thing is, if you really crave power, you're going to end up feeling weak and inadequate unless you have it, which can cause you to try to wield more power, whatever amount you do have, over those people less powerful than you. And maybe those people around you, too. And we can see this behavior of power craving from individuals at the scale of office politics to presidents at the scale of warring neighboring countries. In the design world, though, um, your power will come from the quality of your ideas. After all, you will always have power over your own mind, even if you cannot control outside events, to paraphrase Marcus Aurelius. And then, when you do find yourself with power, put it toward the greater good. The big issues of our day are not petty self-promotion. I like Margaret Atwood again, who said it best when she said, if you have power, don't waste it on squashing snails. Save it for the biggies. So remember what it feels like right now at the start of your career. And when the day comes when you find yourself talking to someone who has less privilege and less power than you do, Make time to listen. Remember, every individual voice adds richness to the orchestra. Be aware, be thoughtful, be dedicated. Work with your strengths and recognize the strengths of others. Start with what you already have. Start with what's there. Dear class of 2021, I wish you the very best. Go far individually, collectively, and be well.